<laughs> okay, and uh, yeah, we're going to register. Okay, so welcome to everybody. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Andre Neguz from MIT, which is going to talk about uh, Lie algebra actions on the Chao uh, groups of, of uh, Hilb K3. And uh, if, ev if everybody wants to keep the camera on like last time, I think it was nice. So anyway, <laughs> please. Thank cool. You. Thank you so much. The invitation is fantastic, and I'm I'm uh, I'm very happy to to be here. Uh, I'm particularly happy to get the chance to talk about this in the derived uh, seminar, even though there will be no derived categories in uh, in this talk. I hope that's no reason to uh, to kick me out of the Zoom room. But you know, some some of your some of what, what I hope are your favorite mathematical objects will feature in this talk, namely holomorphic symplectic varieties. So I hope that that's, uh, that that'll be fun. So one of the problems with annotating on the uh, on the PDF is that you have to erase it every time you go to a new page and you have to do a number of moves. Okay, so th this is what this talk will be all about. The, um, the main motivation for me and others, uh, but the main motivation for us in this talk, and actually I should really, really start by, by, by saying that we, in this case, are Georg Oberdick, uh, Chi Zhengin, and myself. And this is all about our joint paper. So the thing that we are interested in is the following uh, kind of setting. We look at, at, at particular examples of algebraic varieties. Everything is over C. Uh, more specifically, we're interested in holomorphic symplectic varieties, quite a very interesting and rich family of algebraic varieties. And what we're interested in is lifting to, um, to, to the world of algebraic cycles, or lifting to Chow groups, a lot of the classical structures that people have constructed um, in cohomology using all sorts of other tools that don't necessarily come from algebraic geometry. So that's that was one of the main motivators of this work and of many, many other things in the field. I mean, the, this field is by no means new or anything. Um, the particular uh, geometry which I will be talking about today, and this is X, X will be the Hilbert scheme of n points on a K3 surface. So I'll give you a definition of what the Hilbert scheme is in a, in a few slides. I just want to motivate what's going on first. I won't give you a definition of a K3 surface, just leave it, um, I mean, it's the password of the Zoom, right? So, <laughs> so people must have some, some familiarity with the concept of K3 surface just to be in the Zoom room. Uh, everything is over C, so it's kind of, it, it's not a hard, uh, it, it's actually the easiest possible setting you could hope for. So one example of this, uh, of this game that we are playing is the famous conjecture of Boville and Voisin. So what they said is, um, well, in the more general heading of holomorphic symplectic varieties, take the natural map from the Chow groups. So A, let me start annotating here. So these are are Chow groups, namely algebraics, cycles, modulo, irrational equivalence, and these are just the singular cohomology groups. Everything here is an, an algebraic variety over C, so really none, how, how funny stuff when talking about the, uh, the, the uh, Chow and cohomology groups, small g. But I always want to point out that all of these groups are with Q coefficients, so we don't have any, any torsion in our groups. And you just have the can, a natural map which takes an algebraic cycle and remembers, um, well, the a topological underlying cycle, if you will. Now, the conjecture of Boville and Voisin are saying that this map, it, it, it can, can never be injective just because cohomology is so much bigger uh, just because Chow is so much bigger than cohomology. Cohomology is finite dimensional if everything is nice, uh, smooth, and projective. But Chow groups are quite infinite dimensional, so you, so, so, so you would never expect this map to be injective. However, a conjecture that on the subring of Chow that is generated by the visor classes and the churn classes of the tangent bundle, you should see injectivity. In other words, they, they say that any polynomial relation you could have uh, between divisors and churn classes of the tangent bundles in the world of algebraic cycles holds if and only if it holds in the world of singular cohomology. So you have something that holds in the algebraic world if and only if it holds in the, in the topological world. So it's quite a strong statement that had combines these two points of view. 
So with Avesh Maulik, we did not prove this conjecture, unfortunately. We proved a milder version, uh, which actually entails injectivity on the subring generated by the visors. Um, and actually our proof is quite, quite, quite particular for Hilbe and K3. So you, 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 you can't really generalize it to any other, other kinds of geometry. So that's one example of this business. But let me uh, tell you what, the, what this talk will, will be all about. So another a structure which people have known in cohomology is this LLV Lie algebra. Um, the names of the authors are over here. Now, what this Lie algebra is, I'll give you an actual definition, but it's just some finite dimensional Lie algebra. It's actually not scary at all. It's some kind of SO and there are two numbers that you stick in there. So it's a finite dimensional Lie algebra that depends on the, the divisors of X. So in other words, it, it is constructed by taking as input the divisors on X. In our case, X is the Hilbert scheme, but you could actually say this more generally. So the fact that this finite dimensional Lie algebra acted on the cohomology groups is a classical fact that at Huyenga, Luntz, and, Ver and Verbitsky have, um, have worked out more than 20 years ago. But as an example of this game we're playing, one could ask, does this action lift to an action on the Chow groups? So can you, can you complete the dotted line in this picture? And this, this a dotted line in this picture is exactly what Georg constructed in a paper from, um, what was it, two, two years ago, I think. So he constructed a lift of this algebra action to Chow. And this will actually be one of the, the main inputs for this work that I will be talking about, in, about now. I'll, I'll flip the page and I will, I will erase everything because there's no other way, unfortunately, with annotations. So if anyone has any questions, that would be a good time. But I can also just flip the page and erase all of this stuff. All right. So the results above do not just hold when, when X is the Hilbert scheme of a K3 surface. There are, are analogs for other um, holomorphic symplectic varieties. Now, in this, uh, I would like to look a bit at the example of abelian varieties, actually. So it's a, it's a slightly different setting, but let me, let me remind you what happens in um, what happens for the child groups of abelian varieties. So here is a picture which I would say by now is classical, and it was the motivation for the project that we did with the uh, with Georg and Chisheng. So a number of people, and the list on this slide is just like the subset of people whose work we uh, we 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 directly use, but then you know. The people who worked on this problem for abelian varieties is significantly larger than that. And I, I, um, I unfortunately, I can't give um, a complete introduction of the, of the problem. So what the, what the classical picture by now for abelian varieties is, is the following. This Lie algebra action on the Chow groups of the variety in question. So this is exactly, this action here is exactly the analog for abelian varieties of what Georg introduced for the Hilbert scheme that I mentioned on the previous slide. So you have a Kali algebra acting on a vector space. Chow, for the purposes of this talk, is, is a Q vector space. You can break it up into isotopic, into isotopic components for this action. In other words, you have a representation of a Lie algebra. You can break it up into a direct sum of irreducible representations. And that's fancy stuff, but in the equality over here, which I call equality one, I'm actually looking at a much more basic thing. So instead of, of breaking up chow as a representation, as a direct sum of irreducibles, let's just look at, the, at how it breaks up in terms of irreducible representations of a maximal, of a maximal torus of, of G. And this maximal torus is what I will call T. Now, the reason we do that is because the, the irreducible representations of a torus are much easier than those of G. They are essentially just characters. So in other words, you will, you will break up your chow into as a direct sum of pieces, and those pieces are indexed by characters of the maximum health torus. And what these pieces are is actually quite a, a quite easy thing. So by definition, A star X of lambda 
Let me make a nice equal sign here. This is the, the, the totality of cycle C on which uh, the maximal torus acts according to the character T. So A acting on C is equal to lambda A times C for all A in the maximal torus. So if your torus were one dimensional, then and basically what you would get from this construction would be a grading on A star of X. And in fact, this is exactly what I want to focus on in this, um, oh, actually on the next slide. Before I do that, I have to say that inside this, this maximum health torus T, there is a distinguished element. This element will be called H. So we'll see a definition of all of these things in a bit. But this element H called T, this is a chow lift of the degree operator in cohomology. So it's a distinguished element in this algebra. And by restricting the, the, the decomposition one to a decomposition that, uh, that keeps that keeps that keeps track of the eigenvalues of this distinguished element H, then you get a grading on A star of X and this grading lifts the grading in cohomology. Now, the way you get this, this grading in the world of abelian varieties is the, is the following, and this is a construction of Boville. You, um, you look at the operators, you look at the, at the maps on the abelian variety, which are given as multiplication by K. Then you look at the pullback maps, which correspond to that on A star of X. And then the, the statement over here, which is due to, like I said, a number of people who have done a wonderful work about this in, in the years past, these, the pullbacks of these multiplication maps are exactly, are exactly um, the, they, they, they diagonalize exactly in the uh, decomposition one. So in other words, to get the lift to Chow of the degree operator H in cohomology, what you do is you look at the eigenspaces of the operators K star namely the pullbacks of the operators of multiplication on the, on the abelian variety. So th this is a beautiful picture, but unfortunately it's something that you cannot really uh, uh, generalize to Hilbert schemes of endpoints on K3 surfaces because you don't really have an analog of the operator of multiplication by K. You don't have this geometric map and you don't have its pullback in Chow. So we will have to make do with that. And uh, we will have to construct some other, um, some other structures that take the place of these of these operators k star and here's how one does that so this is the main theorem a lot of stuff here has not been defined yet but i just want to put it here to end the introduction um, when x is the hilbert scheme the, the hilbert scheme of endpoints on the k3 surface then we have a decomposition of chow exactly akin to what we saw for a billion varieties on the previous slide it decomposes in terms of the characters of the of the maximal torus of this algebra of this lie algebra so t once again is just a maximal torus of the llv lie algebra Now the first statement of this of this of this decomposition is basically just a tautology due to the fact that G acts on a star of X. But the, the technically complicated part of what we're doing right now is that this decomposition is multiplicative. So I want to put this in a box because from a technical point of view, this is the hardest thing that we prove. It is multiplicative, meaning that if you take the lambda isotypic part of this chow and you take the cup product of something in there with something in the mu isotypic part of the chow, you land in the lambda plus mu isotypic part of chow. So if you think about this lambda decomposition as a grading, once again, if T were just a one dimension uh, torus, then you would expect that taking the cup, a cup product in, in the S piece uh, with something in the T piece lands you in the S plus T piece, that's exactly saying that, that a grading is multiplicative. So what we prove is that in the case of a Hilbert scheme, this, this a decomposition, which I have not yet shown to you how, uh, how you construct it, is multiplicative in this sense. Uh, also, all the churn classes from the tangent uh, of, 
a tangent bundle of X lie in the zeroth piece of this um, of this of the of this of, of this decomposition. So we say exactly how the maximum uh, torus acts on the churn classes of the tangent bundle. It acts on them just by annihilating them because they are in the zero graded piece. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Can I ask? Sure. Uh, I'm a bit confused. So uh, you mentioned that your maximal torus contains this uh, special element H. And you yes. also said that this element H corresponds to the grading. Yes. And uh, the Cherm classes do not lie in the degree zero component with respect to the grading, right? So That's right. So you are, you are right. So uh, I will define for you the, this is an imprecision and I apologize. So what T is, it's actually going to be written as a direct sum of a part called T bar plus the multiples of the grading element. And what I really should say is that the churn classes lie in a star of zero with respect to the T bar part. And is this decomposition canonical, this direct sum decomposition of T? Mm. In the case of Hilbert schemes of n points, you have some uh, you have some explicit. If you take the, the formula for the Picard of Hilbert schemes, which it breaks up as the Picard of the surface plus another factor, then if you take this decomposition as input, then the decomposition which I'm writing here is also canonical. Uh -huh. So uh, you'll so, so, see in a bit. How, so it depends how, on the choice of this special class delta, right? Yes, yes. Or actually, um, so actually it's canonical even regardless of that. I apologize. No, no, it, it's canonical even regardless of that. So, so you'll see a definition of this in a few slides. Okay. And I'll mention this when I get there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. But you are, but you are right. So the, the precise mathematical statement is that the that had with respect, how should I say? If you take an arbitrary element A inside T, well, you, you can break it up into A bar plus a multiple of, um, of H. So let's just, let, let's write it A bar plus, let's say C times H. And the statement over here is that the classes of the form A bar will annihilate the churn classes. And the classes, and essentially H will act on the churn classes in the exact same way as the degree operator was, at, was acting on them in cohomology because you want all of these Chow group features to lift the corresponding features in cohomology. All right, so this is our main theorem. And, and once again, let me say that the main technical difficulty of the result we proved is the multiplicativity of this, of this decomposition. And this is connected with many other things, um, with many other results in, in the field, but I won't have time to go into, into many of those. So I'll just leave leave it somewhat up in the air and say that the multiplicativity is, is a really important part of our work. And uh, can I also ask how sure. big is, is this torus T? Uh, what is its dimension? The dimension of the torus T is, uh, well, T bar is literally the th a second wedge power of the Picard of, the, um, of X. So uh -huh. if your Hilbert scheme has um, has Picard of dimension as A1 of dimension K, then the, the dimension of T bar is K choose two. Uh-huh, I see. So, so, uh, so, yeah. so, so for instance, when the Picard number is one, it is just zero, right? Uh, when the Picard number of the, the surface is one, then oh, the yeah, Picard yeah. Of, the, yeah. of the Hilbert scheme is two. So uh -huh. in that case, the, the dimension of T bar is one. I see. Mm -hmm. And that's the smallest case, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, the fun thing about the construction, and you'll see it in explicit formulas, is it doesn't really depend on the Picard number of the of the K three surface itself. So it takes the, the the Picard of S as input in a certain sense, and and everything is going to be functorial in terms of that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Which makes things a bit a bit easier for us. Also, um, I probably said what I wrote here in words. So. Um, if you look at the at the distinguished grading element of T, then you can specialize the, the composition in terms of the characters of T to a grading 
on A star of X. And the sth piece of this grading is exactly those classes on which H acts by a certain, acts essentially with eigenvalue S. So uh, we have this shift by a degree of C. It doesn't really look nice in terms of the motivation I gave you here, but it's it, it's nice for technical purposes in our paper. So this part over here, this degree part is is a shift in the definition of H essentially. Okay. So probably just make uh, the spectrum symmetric with respect to Yeah, the... that's the whole point to make it to make it hit symmetric around the middle. Yeah, to, to make the middle be zero. And actually I think that it, if I were completely honest, I would also probably have to subtract an, a multiple of n, but then we have um, we have a number of um, of different operators. I, I probably shouldn't mention if anyone is interested in opening our paper. This H is actually called H tilde in our paper, and in a, in a, in our paper, in our paper, H is what is known as H tilde minus n times the identity. So we always have these annoying um, multiples of the identity T line ground, but from the point of view of structure, it doesn't really change much. So I will ignore this minus N times the identity. Um, sorry, I have a quick question. Yep, sorry. So like what, 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 are the, what do the Chow groups actually look like or, or these, these pieces for the, eigen, the eigenspaces, like are any of them finite dimensional over Q or are they all infinite dimensional? They are all infinite dimensional over Q. I mean, I think it's, um, it's pretty much unavoidable when X is the Hilbert scheme of a K3 surface. Um, I think is inside these these uh, these how groups, the the pieces you expect to be fine high, high dimensional are as in the conjecture of Boville and Voisin are the pieces that are generated by divisors and churn classes of the tangent bundle. And indeed, we, you, you can restrict our, our construction to, to those finite dimensional pieces of Chow. But the Lie algebra action exists on the entire Chow and the decomposition exists on the entire Chow, which is presumably infinite dimensional. Um, and I don't think we can say anything about the, the finite dimensionality of any pieces. And in fact, over, over the complex numbers, is it, is it, is it uncountable dimension? The, the whole Chow is, yeah. I mean, as far as I know. And yeah. actually, I think that's true even for the K3, even for the K3 surface itself. Um, but you know, the, the pieces which are generated by by high divisors and churn classes, they should be as big, or at most as big as the cohomology. So definitely finite dimensional. But the entire Chow is is uncountably dimensional in that sense. Yep. Let me see what I had here. Ah. Uh, yeah, so the, the fact that the decomposition, uh, the grading in terms of the eigenvalues of H was multiplicative was already proved by Vial in, um, like 10 years ago by different means. And the, the multiplicativity statement in our theorem actually implies that. So, so basically I would say what our theorem does is it gives um, an alternative proof of that fact. And also it, 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 it lifts everything from um, from just a single grading given by the eigenvalues of H to a more complicated grading given by the isotopic decomposition in terms of irreducible representations of G and of its maximum torus T. So it upgrades everything to, to the world of G representations. So that's, um, that's why this theorem is relevant, I think. All right, let me actually erase everything here and start. Um, so this was the end of the introduction, basically. Let me get on to the uh, definitions. What happened? Oh yeah. Um, so how? So what do we do for Hilbert schemes? We don't have these operators that we had for abelian varieties, namely the operators of of multiplication i k. You don't have that structure on Hilbert schemes. So you will have to find some other techniques. And this is what I. I will define now. So let me start with a definition of what the Hilbert scheme is. So S throughout this talk will be a fixed K3 surface. So it will not even appear in the notation anymore. Hilb N is the Hilbert scheme of N points on the K3 surface. It's an, it's an algebraic variety whose points are in one-to-one -one correspondence with length N subschemes of S. 
So if you want some, uh, some intuition as to what these are, well, a generic length n subscheme is simply a collection of n distinct, an unordered collection of n distinct points of S. But then you have some fancier sub schemes which you get when some of these points uh, collide with, with each other. So, so that's how you can think of the Hilbert scheme in a, in a geometric way, I think. It's not the best a scheme definition of what the Hilbert scheme is, but I, I, won't, I won't really say any more. From the point of view of, uh, of algebraic geometry, it's a two-n-dimensional holomorphic symplectic variety. It's projective. So pretty much the, the nicest kind of variety you could apply all of this business to. And it's also a fine a moduli space. So I'm not going to, to define for you what a fine a moduli space is. It comes with a, it, it just means that it comes with a universal subscheme. So what the universal subscheme is, it is a subscheme inside hill band times S with the property that if you restrict this universal subscheme, let me actually draw the his diagram for you because I think it's nice. So you look at Hilb times S and here you have the curly universal subscheme. If you look at a, at a point of the Hilbert scheme, which is just represented by a length N subscheme of S. So this is, if you look at Z times S inside here, then the restriction of ZN to Z times S is just isomorphic to Z itself. So it, it should be uh, type phase Z and hot curly Z. So this is how you might want to think of this universal subscheme in an in an intuitive way. Um, you know, it doesn't say much about the scheme structure, but that's how you define it using the fact that the Hilbert scheme is a fine moduli space. Put differently, if you're just interested in closed points, you can think of the universal subscheme as being the incidence subscheme that parametrizes a point in hill band and the point in S, if and only if the point in S is in the support of the corresponding length and subscheme. That's another way of thinking about Zn. So, so studying the Hilbert scheme of n points all by itself is quite meaningful, but from a technical point of view, and especially if you want to to recast things in a representation theoretic language, which we will have to for the purpose of understanding G actions, let's consider all the Hilbert schemes together. So still fixing S, just let N vary, let the number of points vary. So let's look at Hilb, which is just going to be the disjoint union of these two n-dimensional algebraic varieties as N goes over all the non negative integers. And let's call this thing Hilb. And let's see what we can do with this. With Hilb, you actually have a lot more freedom on the Chow groups of Hilb, which by definition are just a direct sums of the Chow groups of the pieces. So I probably should say this. So you can define the Chow of Hilb as simply the direct sum or a direct product if you want to do that. But I think for, for the purposes of this talk, it's going to be enough to think of this as the direct sum. And the, the reason why this is a useful thing to do is that you have a lot more operations on the Chow of Hilb than you have on the Chow of each individual Hill band. And concretely, what you have is an action of the Heisenberg algebra on the Chow of the entire Hilb. So this action was studied by Groznowski and Nakajima, and we will study it in the formalism in the language of Nakajima. Um, the way you should think about this this morally is the Heisenberg algebra is really big. It gives you a lot of structure, but it acts from the Chow of Hill bend to the Chow of Hill n prime. If you were just looking at a fixed Hill bend, you wouldn't see much of the really meaningful Heisenberg algebra action. If you want to capture the Heisenberg algebra action in, in all its glory, then you really have to look at all the Hilbert schemes together or all the Hilbert schemes at, at the same time, I should say so. so that is, a motivation for looking at Hilb instead of Hilb n individually. And this is how you define the Heisenberg algebra action. You study, you start from nested Hilbert schemes. So nested Hilbert schemes, I will, I will denote them by Hilb n comma n plus k. And here k, let me just say this, k is an arbitrary positive integer.
And the definition of the nested Hilbert scheme is simply a pair of two sub schemes. One of them ha has length n and the other one has length n plus k. You can probably guess which is which. So this one is length n and this one is length n plus k. With the property that the difference, well, the property that the, a smaller one is a sub scheme of the bigger one and the quotient of, of of these two subschemes is supported at a single point. And this point here is just some arbitrary point on the surface. So this X can be any point on the surface. So why, how is this any different from just asking that two, two half schemes be inside each other? Well, if K is equal to one, then asking for the two subschemes to, to who just be inside each other is equivalent with the property here because if you take a subscheme of length n and a subscheme of length n plus one, her quotient will just be length one, so it's just going to be a single point on S. But if k is bigger than one, a condition you have in 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 this definition is more restrictive than asking just for the two subschemes to be inside each other. You are asking for the subscheme for the bigger subscheme to be the same as the smaller subscheme plus a length k thickening of a single point. So all of the, the complement between these two subschemes is supported at a single point instead of being free to, to, to wander around a surface in any way it might like. So because of this support condition, the nested Hilbert scheme as defined here is, is significantly more restrictive for general k than just asking for the two subschemes to be inside each other. And this will actually be key to having the construction of Nakajima work. How do we do, how do we implement his construction? Well, if you have this nested Hilbert scheme, you have the projection maps to Hilben, Hilben plus K and, and the surface. And these are just the maps which remember a smaller subscheme, the a bigger subscheme and the point where the complement lies. So the, the point called Zn is here, is inside Hilben. The point X is here and the point Z n plus K is here. And Hilben n plus K is just uh, essentially he triples Z n, Z n plus K and X with the property above, a property which you can, which you can see in the formula above. Now, even I'm sorry, side, uh, uh, is it uh, equidimensional, this scheme? Uh, it is actually not known to be equidimensional dimensional in general, but it's known that in that in top dimension, it has a single irreducible component. So it might have some, some weird irreducible components of smaller than expect a dimension, but for the purposes of child groups, those smaller components will not matter. And, and, and this uh, top component has dimension 2n plus 2 or something else? It has dimension, uh, let me tell you what the dimension is. This has dimension, 2n plus k plus one. Ah. So, uh -huh. um, and that's, I think, like k minus one smaller than the expected uh -huh. dimension. Uh -huh. The okay. only exception to his behavior, I was saying is if k is equal to one, if k is equal to one, this thing is nice and smooth and irreducible, everything is super happy. But if k is bigger than one, then I don't think people know how to even show that it's reducible, but, it has a single a component of top dimension and for the purposes of child groups, that component is all we care about. Or in other words, the fundamental class of that component is all we care about. So here's why we only care about that. Let me erase everything here and move on to the next slide. We only care about the top dimension because we only care about this nested Hilbert scheme in as much as it can help us define operators from the Chow of Hilb to the Chow of Hilb times S. And here's how you do it. Well, you have, you have your three maps from Hilb, from the nested Hilbert scheme down to Hilb, there are two maps and down to S that there is a single map and you can just uh, pair up these maps in, in a couple of ways and get operators from the Chow of Hilb to the Chow of Hilb times S. And these operators are called QK and Q minus K. Now you might see that the N has disappeared it has disappeared simply because we take the direct sum or the disjoint union of all of these nested Hilbert schemes for all n. 
So we just let n be arbitrary and k be, be fixed in this construction. And with k being fixed in this construction, you get these operators qk and q minus k. And here is a big slide where I will show you a slight generalization of this construction. So if you have a single operator qk, you can go from the Chao field to the Chao field times s. And if you have t operators, qk1 all the way to qkt, then you can go from the Chao of Hilb to the Chao of Hilb times s to the power t. And the way you do that is you compose these operators by acting as the identity on successive s factors. So you go from Hilb to Hilb times s, and then you just, uh, you, you just uh, take the identity on that s factor and go again to Hilb times s times s, and again and again and again until you do so t times. So a composition of t such operators qk will naturally get you from the Chao of Hill to the Chao of Hill times s to the power t. I don't want to write a formula for what this composition is, but I think intuitively it's, it's what I just explained. Now, once you are on the Chao of Hill times s to the power t, you can do a lot of stuff because you can take any class in the Chao of st, and that would, that would be this gamma over here. And you can simply take the cup product with the pullback of that class on the st factor. So essentially the step over here is just identity on the Hilt component and a multiplication by something on the st component. And then you're still in, in the Chao of Hilt times st. How do you get back to the Chao of Hilt? You push forward. So by taking this composition. So uh, I'm sorry, gamma, gamma is not in s to the power t, but in- Oh, in sorry, power. that's, <laughs> that, right. that is a, Significant typo, I apologize. Gamma is a class in the Chao of ST. Yeah, this was confusing. So gamma is an arbitrary class in the Chao of ST. So essentially what I'm showing you in formula two is how to take an arbitrary class in the Chao of an arbitrary power of S and use it together with the QK operators to get explicit and the morphisms of the Chao of the Hilbert scheme. And this is good for representation theory. If you want to realize a Chao of Hilbert as a representation of something, then you want to get lots of operators in there. And these are lots of operators because when T varies and gamma varies, you actually have quite a big, um, quite a big menagerie of operators here. So this formula is, you know, it's a bit long, but if you think about it, it, it if all you have in the world are the operators qk and arbitrary classes on the powers of s, then the only reasonable way you can construct in the morphisms of the Chao of Hilbert are by this formula here. So I leave it at, at that. Now, the reason why this is relevant from the purpose of, of understanding the Chao of Hilbert is actually these operators, which I call two, are, are enough to to determine the entire Chao of Hilbert schemes. And this is due to a result of the Cataldo and Migliorini. So what they say is that the following thing, I think that they say it in a slightly different language, but it's equivalent to what I'm about to say here. So I wrote these operators too, as endomorphisms from Chao of Hilb, as maps from Chao of Hilb to Chao of Hilb. But if you keep track of the n degree, then these operators will take you from the Chao of Hilb n to the Chao of Hilb n plus the sum of these k's. And that's just a consequence of the definition. So if n is zero, then these operators will take you from the Chao of Hilb zero to the Chao of Hilb k1 plus dot, 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 dot plus kt. Now comes the fun part. The Chao of Hilb zero is extremely easy because Hilb zero is just a point. There is a single length zero subscheme of S, namely the empty subscheme. So Hilb zero is a point. So the Chao of Hilb zero is just a one dimensional copy of Q. And what the Cataldo and Migliorini he say is that the entire Chao of any hill Ben can be constructed by hitting this one dimensional vector space with these operators called two. So as the numbers Q1 through QT vary, and as the class gamma is allowed to vary, you can get the entire Chao of any hill by this construction. So that's one reason why they are useful. They can give you an explicit presentation of the Chao of Hilbert schemes. If there is, uh, I guess your formula for the degree should include the degree of gamma, right? 
Yeah, so this is the uh, grading which I write in the bottom. It, it is simply a grading by the number of points. You also ah. have a second, ah. which is the cohomologic grading, which is somehow buried in this in the star here. So I think if I were being extremely careful about this, then it should map from A star to something like A star plus the degree of gamma. And now I'm definitely going to get this wrong, I think plus K1 plus dot, 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 dot plus KT. But I'm going to put a question mark over here because I can't, I, I can't remember exactly what the what a cohomological grading shift is. But you, our question is, is fantastic because what I should have said is that, is that the Chao field has two gradings on it. So one of them is a grading by N, which is in green on this slide. And the other one is, uh, is the grading on Chao, the cohomological one, if you will, which is in pink on this slide. So that, that's how, how these operators are, are useful. Well, that, that's one application of these operators. They actually have quite a lot of them. And now it's time for me to define for you the LLV Ali algebra. So here's, um, here's what it is. Like I said, the LLV Ali algebra takes as input the divisor group of Hilben. And uh, let, me just, let me just tell you without proof that, that the A1 of Hilben is, is isomorphic to the A1 of the surface itself plus a next a class, which I will call delta. And if n is equal to one, then you have to kill this delta. Uh, the other interesting, the other important part of the input is the Boville pogomolo form. So this is what people call the BB form. And it is explicitly given by the formulas that you see down here. So if you take the th a form of two divisors on S, then it's exactly the same as the intersection pairing of these divisors on the surface S. A divisors on S pair trivially with delta, and the pairing of delta with itself is two minus two n, and this form is non-degenerate. So taking this form as an input, let's construct the following slightly bigger vector space V. So V is, is not just the divisors group of help, which itself is a divisor group of S plus the multiples of delta. But let's take two more symbols, E and F, and let us consider um, a pairing on V, which, which extends a pairing on a divisor group of Hilben, and a hyperbolic pairing on, um, on E and F. So basically what I'm defining for you here is a pairing from V to V in Q, and the, the, the composition here is orthogonal. So the pairing of A1 Hilb with E or F is zero. And then the, the pairing of the Fs and the Es are exactly as you can see in this formula, it's a hyperbolic pairing. So what we have now is- it, Is it some version of, of the Mukai lattice? Yeah, yeah, uh, well, no, actually, I would say E and F are probably that don't come from that. Um, I'm not sure how to think about E and F in that language, to be honest. So let's leave it as just some some, some symbols which you add to the to the A one of Hilb, so as to make the, the definition of the LLV Lie algebra in a in a slightly more uniform way. So so far, E and F are just are just going to will be symbols. So what do we do with them? Well, here it is. The LLV Lie algebra as a vector space is simply the wedge two of V. So it simply means a wedges of arbitrary vectors in V and, the, and, these, and these vectors can either come from the A1 of Hilb or they can be multiples of these extra symbols E and F. And the Lie algebra structure is determined by what the, by this form. So it's given by the formula which you see over here. And basically what it says is if you have A, A prime, B and B prime, and you know the, her values under the, a pairing, then you get the commutator by the formula which I've written over here. So- you know, Does that mean it is SOV? Yeah, it, it, it's SOV and V, um, if you want this, if you want to write it as SO of some explicit numbers, the signature of this, um, the signature of this form is something like the, the Picard number, comma, comma 
four or something. I, I forget what, what, what the exact value is. I think we have it somewhere, but it's it, SO some number comma comma four. Isn't it just SOV for the quadratic form that you just defined? Oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. It's 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 SOV for the add form, and then if you want some explicit SO two numbers, then you just have to compute the signature of that form. And this is the part which I'm I, I, I'm not remembering of the top of my head. Had you right? It's just SOV for this particular vector space V and this particular form here. And let's let's raise the an annotation. So now, now we have a Lie algebra. Because of, of this wedge business, it's a little bit um, not very handy to work with it, but it is a bit easier to write the, um, the wedges which involve E as E alphas and the wedges which involve Fs as F betas. And all of the other are wedges will be called H's and H alpha betas. So here's how you can think of this. If you give E degree one and F degree minus one, and you give alpha degrees zero for any alpha inside the Chow of Hilben, then this expression here has degree one, and this expression here has degree minus one, and these parts here have degree zero. So that explains why we divide the notation into E's and F's and H's. We just give one notation for the degree one things, another one for the degree minus one things, and another one for the degree zero ones. And you can, can work out the explicit Lie algebra relations in terms of, these, uh, of this notation. It just follows from the, from the formula on the previous slide. And I, I won't give you the full List of commutator formulas. It's quite um, it's quite long, but I think that the nice ones are the commutator formulas which involve H. So H commutes with E alpha and with F alpha in exactly the same way as you would expect from the representation theory of SL two, or of any finite dimension the algebra. So the commutator of H with E's is just two times that E with F is minus two, and H's commute with H alpha betas. So these are the formulas and you can work out explicit formulas for the commutators of H half betas with any things. And I should say that this construction in the, in the original setting of LLV, it doesn't even require X to be an algebraic variety. It's just, um, it, it works, I think it works in the context of hyperkähler manifolds. And, and the origin of this construction was, the, was a construction of this, of an action of this Lie algebra on the cohomology of X. And you know, in this talk, I'm I'm pretty much going to be interested in the case when X is the Hilbert scheme of endpoints, and you lift this action from the cohomology to the Chow groups. And this lift was done by Oberdijk. I said um, a couple of years ago, if I remember correctly. And here's what it is. He said that a lift of the action of G on the cohomology of Hilb is given by the following lift, by the following action of G on the Chow of Hilb. So I just have to, to tell you how E's, F's, and H's act. And it, in this formula, you can see that the E's, the F's, and the H's all act by some expression in terms of the Nakajima operators. So it's exactly this construction over here where you take T Nakajima operators and, and stick in them a class in the Chow of S to the power T, and you get an, an endomorphism of Hilp. A particular case of this construction when T is two is exactly what Georg introduced. So he said to get the ELs, FLs, H, LL primes, and, and H, you just need some specific classes in the Chow of S2, and these classes are, are as indicated here. So this class called O is the, a special, a special a distinguished point class on a K3 surface, which was constructed by Boville and Voisin. Now, the formulas over here, they, they don't give you the action of the entire G because what I still have to give you is the, the analogous formulas for when one of the L's is replaced by this uh, special device uh, delta. So I would still have to provide for you the formulas for E delta, F delta, and H L delta, where L is an element inside A1 of S and delta is this, this uh, special element in the A1 
of Hilb, which does not come from the Picard group of the surface itself. Now, I'm not going to give you these formulas because they are a little bit more complicated than the quadratic formulas here. Uh, suffice it to say that they are cubic expressions. So instead of being, instead of being given by products of two QKs, they are given by products of three QKs. And that's what Georg constructed and he checked all of the commutation relations and he proved that did, had these formulas give you an action of G on the Chow of the Hilbert scheme. And this is actually what we, what we will take as input for the main theorem that I will get to in a bit. All right, so we have this action. Um, it, it, if you have the action of G on the Chow of Hilbert schemes, then you can define the th graded pieces that we were looking for as simply the eigenspace decomposition in terms of, um, of the action of, of H of a beta. So it's a little so, bit- Sorry, can, uh, yeah. can I ask a question? So, I yeah, mean, sorry. you define it just for Hilbert schemes, but do you expect such an action to exist in general for K for deformations of Hilbert schemes or moduli spaces of stable it would, schemes? One would hope so, but unfortunately the, the tools we have over here just work for Hilbert schemes. But I don't see why you shouldn't expect such a, a such a, um, a construction to the form. It's just that that formulas on the previous slide, namely the formulas here, do not are the form because we don't have these Q K Q minus Ks, or maybe some deformations exist, but we just don't know what they are. But if someone had an idea of how to get this action for a star of x for an, for an arbitrary holomorphic symplectic variety x, it, it would be fantastic. And I should say, if you can, can get that, then as, as a pretty quick corollary of this, you can prove the injectivity statement in the conjecture of Boville and Voisin for the subring generated of the visors in X. And this is actually known as Boville's a weak splitting property, which as far as I know is not known for an arbitrary X. And if you construct this lift of Oberdick, then you can, as a consequence, obtain this conjecture. So it would be great if people did that. All right, so uh, we have an action of G, hence we have an action of its maximal torus, and this gives us a decomposition of Chow. Of a graded pieces, you can look at, at the graded pieces in terms of the of characters of a maximal torus, or you can just look at a single grading, which is given by how the operator H acts, this distinguished operator H. And um, with that, essentially, oh, I jumped to uh, two slides for some reason. The, uh, the gist of this construction is that these operators H and H alpha beta, which already constructed, they play the same role for Hilbert schemes that those operators K pullback were playing for abelian varieties. They, they are constructed in a very different way because we don't have the operators K pullback for Hilbert schemes, but they play the same role in the theory. So I would say that if one wanted to do this for an arbitrary X, then you would need to find analogs of these operators in Chow. So that is a, a, technical a technical difficulty in this game. All right, so what is the only part of our main theorem which I still need to justify? Well, we have to show the multiplicativity of this decomposition. So multiplicativity just means a formula which you see here on the bottom, namely, that if G is either H or the H alpha betas, then H of a product is given by, you know, a formula over here. In other words, this is just saying that H and H alpha beta, they are derivations of the cup product. So the multiplicativity of the, of the composition is equivalent is saying that H and H alpha beta are derivations. So they satisfy the Leibniz rule as written over here. So that is the thing I want to, um, to explain to you in the last couple of minutes. So here's how we do it. One way we, one way we recast this property is instead of thinking about G applied to C times C prime is blah, let's fix, let's fix a class C and consider the operator of, of, the operator of multiplication by this class. 
let's call this operator mu c, then I claim the property of g being a derivation is equivalent with property four on this slide, namely the commutator of either h or h alpha a beta with the operator of multiplication by c is the operator of multiplication by something. So that is equivalent with saying that at h or h alpha beta is a derivation. So how does this um, change of language make our life easier? Well, you can do some, um, you can do some restrictions. Um, you can do some, uh, some abstract uh, nonsense and say to prove a formula for, for all classes C, it's actually enough to prove it for the churn classes of the universal uh, subscheme. And this is because the churn classes of the universal subscheme, they generate the chow of the Hilbert scheme in some sense. So I, I won't explain how this comes about, but let's just say it suffices to prove formula four for this particular class C, namely C is, is a component of the churn character of the universal subscheme. Now, how do we do that? Well, fortunately, there, there, there is a formula for the operator of, of multiplication by these churn characters. Uh, uh, and this formula was discovered by Li Chin Wang in cohomology. So it's explicitly given by some Hakajima type operator for some explicit class in the Chow of SD. I'm not going to write what this class is because it's pretty huge and I, I don't have time. So Li Chin and Wang proved that her formula in cohomology and with the and with Davesh, we lifted this to Chow. So this formula over here, this holds as, a, as an equality in the endomorphism ring of the Chow of Hilden. And once you have this, then you can prove property for the commutation of G with mu C just as a consequence of the multiplication of the commutation. Sorry, I messed up the slide. So I sought for formula, namely the uh, this commutate relation here is just a formula of the type five because both G is is given by a sum of products of Nakajima operators. And this multiplication operator is a sum of products of Nakajima operators. So you just have to check that a certain commutator of Nakajima operators is another sum of products of Nakajima operators. And these sums are explicit. I just don't have the resources right now to write out what the coefficients are. And now finally, and this is going to be my last couple of bullets. How do you prove such a formula? Well, you know exactly how to commute the Nakajima operators past each other. So you have this very simple formula over here for the commutator of two Nakajima operators. And this is exactly equivalent with saying that the Nakajima operators uh, generate an action of the Heisenberg Lie algebra on the Chow of Hill, because this relation is just the commutator relation in the infinite dimensional Heisenberg algebra. It's essentially saying that the QK is at QK will commute with QK prime unless K plus K prime is zero, in which case the, the commutator is just a simple multiple of the identity. So using this commutator property, you can prove the commutator relation five, which implies the commutator relation which you want. And that's actually how we prove multiplicativity. I mean, you know, that's just the idea of how we prove multiplicativity. In practice, you need some vertex algebra calculus to make sense of all of these coefficients which arise because the sums of products in relation five are rather complicated. So there is some, some, some technical stuff I'm sweeping under the rug here, but the main idea is what, you, is what you see on this slide. So that's how we get multiplicativity and that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions or uh, remarks? Uh, can I ask some questions? Sure. Uh, so uh, first, uh, you, you mentioned a, a slide or two slides ago that, uh, uh, yeah, um, yeah so, so here you have some explicit class on SD. So mm -hmm. uh, the question is uh, whether this class is, uh, in the uh, Boville Voisin ring? Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So this class is like this. It, it's either the small diagonal or the small diagonal multiplied by the class O. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Boville and Voisin's. Okay. So it's quite easy. 
Uh -huh. Good. And uh, another question is, uh, if your K3 is a uh, Kummer, mm -hmm. uh, is there some compatibility between uh, the decomposition uh, for, for the corresponding abelian surface and uh, this K3? That's a fantastic question, and we have not thought about that in the very least. <laughs> but it's a great question. Uh -huh. I'm sorry about that. It, it, it's a deep question, but I, I really don't know how to say because I haven't thought about it at all. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Can, can I ask some questions? So, uh, um, so if you don't look at the Chow groups, but K0, so the growth and group, so mm -hmm. does some of this work, do you know? Um, I'm not exactly sure what the lift of, uh, of the LLV uh, uh, Lie algebra is to K zeros. I mean, even in the, in the topological setting, you, you have the Lie algebra acting on cohomology and you, you could say, can we say anything interesting about topological K groups? Um, other than just saying that the topological K groups are isomorphic to Chow by the churn character, which is not extremely useful. I don't know of a nice uh, deformation of the Lie algebra action. So, because it hasn't been done in K theory on the topological level, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't venture to do it yet in the algebraic level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. And another question. So, the construction depends on S. Right? I mean, in the sense that you have Hilp S. Yep. And uh, how, like, if if your Hilp sch Hilbert scheme is isomorphic to Hilp of two different S S and S prime, mm -hmm. will these um, structures be different? That's a good question. Um, I don't think anyone has studied the, the question of whether of how the the Nakajima operators behave under these isomorphisms. So all of the all of the bits and pieces of this action we defined are in terms of the Nakajima operators. If these are compatible under isomorphisms from Hill best to Hill best prime, then the answer to your question is everything should be compatible. But no one, as far as I can tell, has checked this. But uh, actually, I'm not sure that it is possible to have a compatibility of all Hilb n for s and s prime. I mean, some that's true. That's true. Yeah. And can coincide, but not all of them. So probably uh, it, it's hard to make uh, some meaningful question about this. Maybe. So I, I'm not sure. I guess what Sasha is saying is that you could have a setting where the first Hakajim operator, it increases the n to n plus one for one surface, but it increases it from n to n plus some other number for a different surface. And this might mess up the Heisenberg algebra relations. And finally, can I think, yeah, thanks. Can I also ask about uh, that's grading operator H? So can you explain a bit what, what it does? Because uh, you said lifting grading from cohomology, but mm -hmm. Chow groups they are graded. But you don't yep. mean you mean you don't mean just the grading on the Chow groups. You mean nope. some kind of no, no, some no. Kind of... And that's why this is quite meaningful. So, um, I probably should just give you the example of the um, of the K three surface itself. So, if you take the K three surface itself, the story is that if you look at A two S. It's very big. But inside this A2S, there is just the multiples of the special class C plus some other stuff. And that other stuff is what I call very big. And H, it acts in the way you expect from cohomology on the class C. So H of C is equal to two times C. But on the other part, H acts with other eigenvalues. So on this part, the operator H will act with eigenvalues one and zero. So uh, I think uh, your notation for C was O. What? Oh, oh, sorry, yes, yes, C is O, C is O. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the, the, the eigenvalues of the operator H in Chow don't really have much to do with the uh, with a grading on Chow, except if you're looking at elements which are which are in the subring that is generated by divisors and churn classes. So whenever you have a class which is a, a sum of products of divisors and churn classes, then the eigenvalue of H is exactly what you expect from cohomology. But if you have some other class, then and then H is just some random thing. 
Yeah, thank you. And in general, is it supposed to be this block building and filtration on, on child groups? Yes, yeah, it, it, it's, it's connected with that. So it's, um, it's supposed to be like the smallest piece of this conjectural filtration. Uh, and that, that part is what I call here, sorry, let me go to the first page. That uh, smallest piece of the filtration, I think is what I call a, a star of X comma zero. Sorry, I'm having trouble finding it now. Yes, this part here should be the smallest piece of that filtration. And it's where all the, the uh, churn classes live. And, and by the way, uh, does this uh, uh, theorem that you explained implies the injectivity on of the morphism to the cohomology? On um, some th a theorem of Georg does. So let me, uh, sorry, my pencil stuck. Let me go back to the theorem. Uh, not that a theorem which we proved with Georg and with, uh, and with Qi Zheng, so not, not the main theorem of this talk, but the theorem over here implies the injectivity of the map from the subring of Chow generated by the visors to the cohomology. So that is Boville's weak splitting property. And how does it imply? Um, it's, it, it's essentially um, very easy for a module of this Lie, of this Lie algebra to be irreducible. So I think, uh, I actually think that, that this was also, was already present in the paper in the work of Berbitsky where he studied this kind of stuff, but you have uh, you have this Lie algebra acting on um, on the cohomology, and I I would say by I'm not sure how his argument went, but something like Bob by something as easy as dimensional reasons, then uh, then he could get injectivity, and I think the the argument in Chow is similar, uh -huh. but I haven't actually given it lots of thoughts, so this is a question for Georg, I think. Okay, thanks. So the, the story here is, is the following. Uh, with Davesh, we proved the, the injectivity um, that I mentioned at the beginning of, of the talk. And we did this using the representation theory of the Virasoro algebra, which is a big and rather complicated infinite dimensional Lie algebra. And then Georg observed this fact about a lift to Chow of the finite dimensional Lie algebra G. And he was able to get the statement for the injectivity of the visors are using this much more economical <laughs> Lie algebra. So in a certain sense, his proof of the injectivity statement is more elegant than ours because he, because he uses a more elegant Lie algebra, a more economical Lie algebra, I should say. I mean, maybe you should say it's just Shua's lemma in some sense. Yeah, I mean, it is Shua's lemma. <laughs> so, you know, you, you have him here, so, <laughs> so I have him explain it. Okay, if uh, there are more questions for Georg or for Andre. If, if not, uh, uh, let's thank uh, Andre again for the for the Thank you very much. Talk. And I guess uh,